I'm in Manchester with Jim Dyers in a room full of people talking about asset-based uh, community development. And Jim's just given us a terrific presentation, really based on stories from the last 30 years of his and other people's experience of how you build communities using the assets in the community, taking an optimistic um, approach. And Jim, you had uh, seven principles there. Um, tough to ask you to reel them off <laughs> um, without your PowerPoint, but how can you do? I know the first one uh, was? First one is to have fun, and it's probably the most important one, the one that uh, we often forget. Uh, we take our community work way too seriously. Our community work's all built around meetings, uh, and we wonder why we have such tough competition with television, which, which studies have shown is the number one thing taking people out of community life. Probably add Facebook and other uh, video as well. But uh, the key to getting people engaged and the key to competing with television and, and making community more engaging is to have fun. That, that uh, Too much of our work is based around meetings. Uh, too much of it is, uh, we, we think about it as our cross to bear. And I have a friend who says, why have a meeting when you can have a party? So that's the, that's the first lesson. The second lesson is start where people are. Uh, that, there's several levels to that. The first one is to, uh, to start physically where people are, on their block or on their street. The closer you involve people to where they live, the more likely they are to get engaged. The second part of starting where people are is to be cognizant of their language, of their culture, to start with their language, not with our professional, not with our specialized language, not with our activist language, but the language that the people speak, and to be sensitive to their culture. Um, another aspect of starting where people are is to um, uh, start with their networks. That too often times, again, we're trying to bring people into our networks, and we forget that most people are already organized, that just about everybody belongs to some kind of network. And they only have so much time in their lives. So if we want to get people engaged, it's much easier to reach out to whole networks of people and bring them in rather than one person at a time. And it's, it's especially the way to get uh, diversity of people involved that we probably never get in a single organization by reaching out to all those different associations of people who are unlike the people in our network. If a fourth part is starting where people are is to focus on their passion. So too often times we start with what we're passionate about and we wonder why nobody gets engaged. We call people apathetic. Uh, nobody's apathetic, everybody cares deeply about something. So if we want to get them engaged, we should start with a question rather than with an answer. And that question is, what's your hopes for your community? What keeps you awake at night? If we can tap into people's passions, give them a sense they can do something about it, they're much more likely to get engaged than if we just spend all our time trying to convince them to care about what we care about. And the uh, fifth part of starting where people are is to focus on their call. Uh, this is a lesson I learned from a friend who is a duck hunter. And my duck hunting friend taught me that every duck responds to a call. There's just a different call for every duck. And that too often times in our organizing work, we just sound the loon call, and we wonder why only loons come out to our meetings. Uh, in fact, everybody will come, we just need to use their call. A lot of people respond better to the social call than they do the meeting call or the volunteer call or the project call. The wider range of calls we have, the more people are going to get engaged. And once we start building relationships, then people are more likely to come to meetings. But we too often lead with the meetings and wonder why only the same people keep coming out. A third part of, uh, a third uh, a key to building broad and inclusive engagement is that while it's important to start where people are, it's also important not to leave them there. People need to see results from their activity or they aren't going to stay engaged. So many people are feeling powerless these days. They're saying, God, I can't fight City Hall. Uh, uh, they're, they're just, uh, they haven't had a good experience with community. So people need to be involved in a way where they can see results from their participation. So it's important to involve people in issues or projects that are immediate, concrete, and realizable. So people can get some sense that through collective action they can make a difference. Doesn't mean we shouldn't work on big issues like world peace and climate change, but people are never going to work on those big issues if they don't think they can even make change in their own block. A, uh, uh, um, what number am I up to yet, Dave? <laughs> uh, another uh, 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 key rule in uh, getting people engaged, another key to uh, community engagement, is to um, uh, not sit on your assets. And the key here is to recognize that absolutely every individual in our community has incredible strengths and has incredible gifts to give to their community. We like to think about these as three kinds of gifts. One are gifts of the head, that person's unique knowledge, 
gifts of the heart, that person's passions, and third, gifts of the hands, that person's skills. And while absolutely everybody in our community has these uh, gifts, the problem in our society is that increasingly we're putting labels on huge sections of our population that label people not by their gifts, but by what they are missing. We use terms like homeless, disabled, at-risk youth, old people, non-English speaking, that define people by what they're missing rather than by their gifts. And when we do that, they become clients in a service system. If we can lift off those labels and focus on the gifts that every individual has, then they become citizens in our community. Because that's what community is all about. It's about giving gifts to one another, sharing our gifts with one another, recognizing everybody has needs, but everybody also has incredible gifts. And community is about that mutual support where we share everybody's gifts in order to address everybody's needs. And uh, uh, the fifth lesson I learned about getting people engaged is to lead by stepping back that we have too many of the self-proclaimed leaders in our community complain that nobody else will pick up the work. Nobody else, will, nobody else can do this job the way I do it. And the problem is, is that they have uh, see themselves as invaluable to the community work and that there's no substitute for that particular individual. And they're probably right. Nobody else is going to step up and do that job 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a week. People generally step into very much smaller roles and grow into bigger roles. And they're going to take on what they're comfortable with. So we need to start thinking about collective leadership, about shared leadership, about how we can build on everybody's strengths in uh, carrying out the work of the organization. The um, sixth uh, lesson I learned is about the need to recognize and celebrate caring neighbors. That we're all working so hard, we're so focused on, 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 on the work that we often forget to celebrate. And it's so important to lift up those individuals who are contributing so much to our communities and give them a little recognition for what they do and to inspire other people about what's possible, to help other people think about themselves in that role. Uh, because those people never show up in the media. The media tends to focus on all the negatives in our community. But to hold up those individuals, unsung heroes, who are making such a difference in our community and, it's, and encourage them to do even more. And then finally, the seventh lesson I learned is to share stories. That again, we don't see the stories of success in the media. We don't hear those community stories. We often talk about how uh, institutions are motivated by data, but really what motivates communities, what inspires communities are stories. Stories about people like themselves, stories from their own community, stories about how people may change by building on their own strengths and assets. And those stories will inspire people to do similar actions themselves. Projects are great, outcomes are great, but if the stories aren't shared, we're missing a very valuable part of that story.